Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Speed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and... Take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAA. It's one 450 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour. I want to remind everyone we are changing the format of the feedback, the way that we are interpreting the feedback. Previously, I just did feedback the way that every other show does feedback, which is that you scan through the list of 100 emails that come in and pick the ones that you think are most relevant to the most amount of people and then you go for it um and so i've been very fortunate and blessed to have some people in the community step up and say hey let's you know can we help uh, and one of those people is steve ovens and he's offered generously to go through um the email each week and and kind of categorize and so what we're doing is we're collecting feedback on where user problems are and what people are experiencing, what people have questions about, and then we're formulating uh, segments around that. And that includes the feedback section, which we've moved, if you haven't noticed, to the front of every episode. So send us feedback live at asknoahshow.com. Our first email comes from Nick. Nick writes and says, Greetings. My day job is a security systems CCTV access control and everything else under the low voltage umbrella. I wanted to share that your recommendation for exact vision was great. I've been a certified exact vision tech for years now. Their licensing structure is terrible. However, only good for them. So I'm recommending to our clients that one of EMS solution to consider digital watchdog and their spectrum system. It's based on another company's product called NX witness from a company called network optics network optics, by the way, spelled O P T I X basically is an OEM for them so that they can put their brand on it. It's also the brand for Hanwha, which is formerly Samsung, and the WiseNet Wave. Spectrum supports Linux and Windows for the file server and Linux, Windows, and Mac for the client software. The best part is lifetime upgrades. Keep up the great work, Nick M. So thanks a lot. I had a chance to check this out. Um, this is absolutely fantastic. I've, 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 uh, I sent the link over to our lead installer at Altaspeed to have him check it out and see what he thinks. Um, so we're going to probably spin one of these boxes up and kind of see how it works um, and see how it works in, in real life. But I, this looks great. And, and again, when you start from the standpoint, I've gotten a lot of people have said, I can't believe you're going with these proprietary solutions instead of open source ones. When the open source solutions get there, I'm, I'm on board to, to, to give those to clients. But the reality is I can't force someone to use a piece of software. And when you have an individual that has two options in front of them, and one is they can go over to the nearest big box store and they can pay $70 and they can take a little device and screw it up to the wall themselves and go online and type in the serial number and it activates onto their app. And now they can watch and review their recordings. There's no way they're going to pay us or any other professional thousands of dollars to come out and run wire and install cameras and do all of that unless there is massively added value benefit on top of that. And unfortunately, as much as I care about privacy and as much as you may care about privacy, it's not my place to tell other people to care about privacy. It's only my, it's only my place to tell people that here's what you should be aware of. And then you can make your own decisions based off of that information. And so certainly when we sit down and self, you know, devices or products to clients, we tell them, hey, here are what your options are. Here's why this is what I put in my house, but you make your own decision. Um, Once we have left the line of free and open source software, then it, 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 it becomes blurry, right? It doesn't really matter what you're using. It doesn't really matter what the licensing model is. It really just matters, does it fit that particular business Model. It's never anything that I'm. I'm gonna. It's never anything I'm gonna get excited about. It's never a project I'm. I'm gonna uh, drill all over because at the end of the day, we don't actually know how long, if ever, it's going to exist. Synology, I guess, kind of gets a break in there to a certain extent, just because they have an established track history. Every, ever, I think every Linux conference I go to, I see people from Synology and I see people from QNAP. At least the bigger ones, smaller fests, maybe not so much. Um, but they run Linux and they're involved in the community and, and, and so on and so forth. They just license their software as proprietary. And maybe someday uh, they'll think 
uh, they'll rethink that because I think if they offered DSM as an open source project that anybody could self host, um, that'd be great. I suppose a lot of people would not be buying Synologies though. Our second email comes in, uh, we don't have a name for him, but he says, hi, Noah, thanks for a great show. In episode 204, a listener wanted a surveillance system a quarter mile away from the house. Axis has this, and he sends a link to the Axis Long Range PUE Extender Kit. The relevant data borrowed from the P16 in the manual is that the range is increased to 2,250 feet. Well, excuse me. A 100 base connection is increased to 2,250 feet or 690 meters. Or the 10 based connection will go up to 3,100 feet or 950 meters. To put that into perspective for you, the, the, the typical limit on, on network runs is about 300 meters. Um, the actual range of the cable depends, of course. Dehu has something they call the EPOE 300M, 100 megabits per second, 800 meter. The benefits PoE, of course, you don't need a solar panel, you don't need a battery. Uh, the risk is, of course, if there's a lightning strike, this thing is going to go out. He uh, he says, now make sure that we're considering the fact that you're also going to need things like surge protector, outdoor cable. Outdoor cable uh, shouldn't be used indoors. Um, and so uh, th those are all really great recommendations. Again, I think the fundamental problem that that caller emailer had an issue with, and I, I think the thing that we all kind of struggle to solve is his, um, I think he was in a $500 to $1,000 price range is what he wanted to do, and I think he wanted to be on the lower end of that, and I think that's just a difficult distance to get networking at any price, really. Our third email uh, comes from Joel. Joel writes in and says, Hey, Noah, I've been listening to his show for a while, and I'm really enjoying it. One of the episodes, you mentioned a way to see the Windows key that's embedded in your device's hardware. Unfortunately, I can't find that episode again, but I'd like to stop dual booting. I need Windows and some school-related stuff. How would I get my Windows key to use it for a virtual machine? And does this fit under the Microsoft Terms of Service? Indeed, Joel, it does fit underneath the Microsoft Terms of Service. In fact, they go on to specify that you can use it inside of a VM if you'd like. Uh, the command that you're looking for is sudo space strings space slash sys slash firmware slash acpi slash tables slash msdm. I've also included it for you in the show notes at podcast podcast.asknoahshow.com. So you can go to podcast.asknoahshow.com slash 208. And uh, that command is listed there for you. Our fourth email comes in from my buddy, Adram. Adram writes in and says, Hey, Noah, I have a slate travel router that I have serving up the Wi-Fi and the router in my fifth wheel. I tried USB tethering to a dedicated cell phone that sit just sits next to it to serve as a cellular internet connection, but was getting a fraction of the transfer rate and the slate was running hot. So the slate is tethered to via Wi-Fi on the phone's hotspot. I have a few SSIDs, IoT, guest, personal 2.4 gigahertz, personal 5 gigahertz that run off of the slate that my devices and computers connect to. I've been having issues lately the past couple of months with drop packets, and sometimes the connection will entirely drop between the slate for two or three minutes. Tethering my laptop or desktop to the phone doesn't replicate that problem, so I think that the slate will need to be replaced with something with a little bit more juice. I'm on the RV, so I don't have the space to set up an old desktop with a WAP, but I'm not against something like a small SOC with a few one gigabit NIC cards. I want to add a NAS in the future and have a wired connection for my workstation that I'm building into one of my fifth wheel slide outs. Man, I want to see pictures of that when it's done. What would I, what would you recommend for replacing the slate in these situations? I've been looking at small all-in-ones, things like Microtech and WAPs and uh, x86 SOP and WAPs, but there's a lot of choice to cut through. Let me know your thoughts. Your buddy, Adram. Yeah, that's a that's a great thought, Adram, and I appreciate you writing in. So let's start here. Uh, what we've done uh, for clients in the past, and, and indeed what I would do in this situation, is I would look at something like PFSense. And the reason is, and the reason that we use PFSense is precisely for these kinds of situations. If you go to netgate.com slash PFSense slash latest slash cellular, uh, they have a list of known working 3G and 4G modems that you can use. They also have a dedicated page for configuring specific Verizon devices, as well as some resources on 3G if you're trying to, uh, you know, have a cheaper modem that you're just using for backup. Um, but the fact that they offer this out of the box, the, uh, the other thing is because the SG-1100 is made by Neki and is a very small pocket-sized DC-powered device, it would be very easy uh, to do this with something like that. Now, I've tr I have set up in the past, uh, I've done this on Microtech. It certainly is possible. It's just not quite as intuitive. Um, so you could save a little bit of money. But the, other pr the, the, the problems that I've, I've run into with the Microtechs 
uh, which is kind of the problem that you ran into with the slate is they run out of processing power fairly quickly. Um, they work fine for the, the smaller ones anywhere work fine for learning about router OS and, and, and learning how to set all of those things up. But when you start having uh, a lot of firewall rules and a lot of different VLANs that are maybe processing traffic differently, um, though all of those things take up processing power on the router. And I've, I found that the little hex units uh, don't have enough juice. And once you start to get up into the price at where you, uh, where you'd ha where that isn't a problem. Now you're, now you're in the price range of an SG-1100 and dollar for dollar, $200 SG-1100 will outperform uh, a $200 comparable Microtech in my experience. And so um, the other thing is you can run it on custom hardware. So if you did have an Intel NUC or uh, another thing that's really popular if you're custom building something is the thin clients that HP and Dell make. There are a lot of them if you search on eBay. PFSense, you'll see people that have found specific thin clients that work very well for PFSense. And because a lot of them already have dual NICs in them, uh, it makes them an ideal hardware choice. So you can check into that. But overall, you just have a lot more options. You can start by spinning something up in a VM and you could tether to a spare laptop if you wanted to just see if it works or how it works or how you can get it set up. You do have the ability to fail over to a landline from your RV if you have one. So this is something that we've set up again, both on Microtech and PFSense. But the way it would work is this. You might have your primary connection is ETH0 and your backup connection is the, the, the USB LTE modem. And you would set it up such that if there's a connection present on ETH0, it will send all of the data out there. If it fails, then it just seamlessly falls over to, to cellular. And in that way, all of your devices, they get an internal IP, they're connected to the, the access point of the RV, and, uh, but the internet, the internet pipe can change. As for actual Wi-Fi, I would recommend one thing and only one thing, and that's Unify. Um, you, once you leave Unify as a brand, you're basically a thousand bucks before before you're at the next comparable thing. Um, they just there, there's nothing even close to that price range that can do what Unify does. So pick up a UAP AC Pro if you want to save a little bit of bit of money. UAP AC Lite, uh, if it's just an RV and you just really kind of need to connect. Um, if you wanted to go super cheap, you could certainly uh, you could certainly buy another Wi-Fi card, add that to PFSense, and again, like, like you kind of circle back to, uh, you could build an all-in-one device. I did a little bit of research. It turns out you can tether PFSense directly through a phone, uh, through a USB cable, but it requires a specific kernel. I've not tried this, um, but I did include a link for you in the show notes at podcast.snowshow.com, so make sure to check those out if that's something you want to try. Albin writes in and says... Hi, Noah. Could you please suggest to me a cheap microphone uh, that would be good for digital meetings, both with Windows, with, both with and without video? I currently only have a webcam, Logitech C920, that I use for live video and audio calls. But when I received co several complaints on my sound quality, bringing a webcam from ca campus is a bit of a hassle. I'm a computer science student, and the microphone will mostly be used for Zoom calls. I'm mostly at home nowadays, aren't we all? But I would prefer a microphone that's easily packed in a backpack, brought with me on campus, at regular campus returns, obviously running Linux on my old ThinkPad X230. Thanks for all your hard work. So a couple of things. First of all, anything under $100, um, they're all about on par with each other. There's, I, I don't know if there's any under $100 mic that just, that just sings. There are some that will get higher reviews from Amazon, but usually that's because of build quality, not because of the actual audio quality. Essentially, they're all cheap Chinese condenser mics that um, are going to pick up a ton of room noise. Um, but if you can get it to a quiet hotel room or, or, or an, you know, a, a dedicated bedroom, something like that, it's going to offer an incredible value for your dollar. Um, you can find these as cheap as 30 bucks on Amazon. And I've yet to see one that doesn't work natively right out of the box with Linux, because again, they're all just cheap Chinese things. So it's fairly, they're fairly well understood how they work from a driver standpoint. But Above that, there is a class of USB microphones that is quote unquote better uh, than the than the kind of entry level cheap Chinese things. And these are the Yetis and Sennheisers and Audio Technica. And again, would I say that they have an incredibly high uh, quality digital to audio uh, analog to digital audio converter? No, it's still a cheap device that's placed into a microphone. But there's you can you can you can think that there's been some research into comparing how one works from the other because these brands do have a name to protect for, from themselves. Uh, and, and so I've, I've, I have experience with the Yeti. They're okay. Um, my, the Sennheiser is really great, but you're gonna pay a little bit more money. My, probably my favorite one is the Audio Technica AT2020 USB. And I've used the AT2020, which is the XLR version of that microphone. Again, they've 
added a very cheap little uh, interface that that helped. Well, actually, it's not really that cheap. It's actually a, a half of the cost of the original mic. Um, but it sounds better. And it sounds more professional. Now, I want to be clear. These kinds of microphones are really geared towards broadcast, not so much meetings. But the truth is, if you're just looking at meetings, there's plenty of ways to get cheap USB uh, you know, headsets. And, and, and webcams are actually very popular for those kind of things. So if you're looking to increase the, your, your quality, then this is definitely a way to go. One other thing to consider, though. Zoom today, Hangouts calls from an audio standpoint, really what you're trying to do, really what we are trying to do is replace the traditional conference phone with a speakerphone. And so in that vein, what we've done at Alta Speed for clients is we've started recommending the Anchor Power Conf. And this is a Bluetooth uh, powered speakerphone that pairs directly to your laptop or or your phone. And basically what it does is it has a bunch of uh, unidirectional mics that are all positioned around so that multiple people could participate. Of course, you could just set set it closer to you and just use one person. Um, but this is going to be a very natural way to make the same kind of experience that you would have had with a kind of polycom intercom conference phone that sits in the middle of the table while you're on a conference call uh, and, and sitting there having that experience now on your computer through Bluetooth. The nice thing is because it's a generic Bluetooth device, you can use it with your phone, you could use it with your laptop, you could use it with your tablet. Um, and so there, we find them to be pretty universal. Uh, so I do have, um, I have both the AT2020 USB link for you in the show notes, as well as that Anchor Power Comp. I would invite you to check that out. Our pick of the week this week is Lemmy, building a federated alternative to Reddit in Rust. Lemmy is, Lemmy is similar to sites in like Reddit or uh, lopsteer.com. RS, Hacker News, you subscribe to forums that you're interested in, posts, likes, discussions, vote, and then comment on them. Behind the scenes, it's very different. Anyone can run a server, and all of these servers are federated, very similar to Matrix, and they are connected to the same universe called the Fediverse. The overall goal is to create an easily self-hostable, decentralized alternative to Reddit and other link aggregators outside of their corporate control and meddling. Each Lemmy server set up its own moderation policy, appointing site-wide admins and community members to keep out the trolls and foster a healthy, non-toxic environment where all can feel comfortable and contributing. Note, Federation is still in active development, and the WebSocket, as well as the HTTP API, are currently unstable. But Federation has now been enabled for Lemmy.ml. And so if you want to check this out, if you're looking for an alternative to Reddit, and I would very much like an alternative to Reddit, particularly if it's an alternative to Reddit that doesn't come with all the toxicity of Reddit, uh, Lemmy is something I'd be interested in checking out. Now, some of you may remember Vote, vote.co, V-O-A-T.co, which really was uh, was started to be an alternative to Reddit, but then just be kind of came a cesspool. The thing that, and people are comparing the two, and I think there's a big difference here, and the, I, the, the biggest difference is with Lemmy, again, just because it supports federation doesn't mean you have to federate. It doesn't have to be just one instance, right? Like we can all have our separate instances and we don't necessarily have to talk, but we can. And I think that's super powerful. Uh, so you want to learn more, lemmy.ml, L-E-M-M-Y.ml. Of course, we'll have a link for you in the show notes. Our gadget of the week is the dev term by Clockwork Pi, clockworkpi.com. The dev Term is a postmodern digital minimal, uh, minimalist lifestyle notebook. The A5 notebook size integrates with the PC functions with a retro futuristic design, a 6.8 inch display, a QWERTY keyboard, necessary interfaces, high speed wireless, and long battery life. And they include a thermal printer with this thing. So, I, on the surface, this seems crazy. And I had the opportunity to visit Japan a few times. And if you ever get the chance, I highly recommend it, particularly if you're from a Western country. Um, because it'll open your eyes. And there's a popular destination for geeks in Japan called Akihabara. Uh, and Akihabara Electric Town is, is, is the nickname. And if you, kind, if you can imagine a, a bunch of street vendors, almost like a fair for blocks and blocks and blocks, every kind of electronic that you can imagine. Everything from individual capacitors and resistors to complete radio transmitters, computers, circuits, wires, chassis, anything that you would need to build or need to buy that plugs in or has electricity can probably get here. And the most famous store is where they sell, you know, completed prod products is Yoroboshi Akaba. And I don't know how many stories tall it is, but it's a big store. 
And they have entire sections in this store dedicated to devices that don't even exist in the UK or the US. One of those is, well, I shouldn't say they don't exist, they're just not popular. One of those is word processors. And when I first saw it, and I, I'm not kidding, there's a whole section of a store dedicated to word processors, kind of like you'd have like an electronic section at Best Buy. Like that's how much, that's how many different models and various styles and things that they have for word processors. And so I, you know, I talked to the sales guy and looked at the little tags and started to uh, kind of understand who is the person that would buy this thing. And it dawns on me, if you think about it, when you're sitting down to concentrate on a task like software development, you want to write code, or you need to SSH into a server, you need to edit a config, or troubleshoot why something isn't working, or trace a path, or whatever. I'm going to go ahead and include writing and creative planning in those in that group as well, because I think that there's a, there's a good argument to be made that just people who want to sit down and self-reflect and think um, can use technology to do that if they cannot be interrupted. And there is real value in not being in a web browser all the time. There is a real value in not being on a messenger all the time. And so when I grab my re laptop to research something, I'm incredibly frustrated with myself sometimes when two hours later I'm on Wikipedia reading about nuclear fusion rather than getting done whatever it is I sat down to get done. And so being able to limit distractions and focusing on a single task is very cool. The other thing, if you consider how we work when we go to coffee shops or when we go, uh, you know, sit down to have lunch, we want to pull something out, we want to work on something, then we want to put it back. That ability to turn something instantly on or off and not have to worry that we're going to run out of battery is a big deal. And that's what this device offers. So inside you get a Cortex A72 1.8 gigahertz processor, four gigabytes of RAM and a Mali T864 video processor. It features a real keyboard. So the, it, is perfect for things like writing, coding, emails, making indie games, running most video game emulators. And they say, if you usually use web applications, uh, the module provides you with more memory to improve your experience. Not really what the device is designed for, but they're not stopping anybody from developing for it. For users who require high performance and computing power, such as algorithm development and tuning, rapid prototyping of embedded devices speeding up your compiling time uh, is happening. The A06 series will provide you a better solution. We'll provide you with the option of a dev term kit without the core module. We especially cut down, we specifically cut the main board in half, half of it reserved to carry the imagination and the possibility of do it yourself. And this half is called the extension module or EXT module. The device out of the box can, uh, features integrated 5G Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 5.0, standard USB A 2.0 interface, uh, three of those on there and an internal contact interface for the keyboard module, which functions over USB apparently. Uh, type C charging port, of course, TF card, micro USB slot, 40 pin MIPI screen interface, micro HDMI interface, a 3.5 inch headphone jack and supports a microphone input, an onboard stereo audio power amplifier chip. Then they have 40 pin GPIO expansions, what they referenced above, and then a 52 pin extension module using standard mini PCIe connectors. And get this, all of the scat schematics and the design materials are being released under GPL3 and you can find them on their GitHub account. Clockworks, uh, Clock, excuse me, Clock Pi version 3.14 is compiled with the Raspberry Pi 3 CM3 series, which means that your work on the Raspberry Pi can be teleported to a portable terminal in seconds. More possibilities such as an AI accelerator, 4G, 5G module, software defined radio, oscilloscope, FPV ground station, audio mixer, game cassette recorder, EEG, ECG monitoring modules, and even a microscopic slide analyzer modules have all been envisioned. As some are some areas of the application potential have exceeded our background, we especially look forward to seeing what happens in our community. Experts from various professionals, fields, bringing in extremely exciting creative works to dev term. So really what they have today is really just the beginning. And you can learn more at clock at clockworkpi.com slash dev term. We'll have a link in the show notes. Pipewire may be coming to Fedora and Pulse Audio and Jack uh, may be being replaced. So to discuss with me uh, in our interactive Jitsi room is Neil Gump, a Fedora contributor. Hey, Neil, welcome into the program. Hey, Noah, it's nice to be here again. It's been quite a while, I think, since the last time I, I showed up on, on this program. 
It has. I think uh, I think we were talking uh, about Butter FS last time. Yeah, that was it. Yep. So the end goal here is to wind up with one audio infrastructure for both the desktop and pro user use cases. And so obviously that immediately catches my attention because that, you know, just makes my life uh, fit like a glove. Um, and the idea is that they're going to end the fragmentation of the audio landscape. Now, Neil, before we go any further, you've been, uh, I think, a pretty positive proponent of Pipeware. What's your initial thought to this? So I think that the way that uh, the way that audio in Linux works today is a situation that should have never been allowed to happen in the first place. Uh, and my my feeling about you know the consolidation and the the reintegration of the various paths to supporting uh, doing high quality audio on Linux into into one uh, layer uh, is something that couldn't come soon enough. Uh, and so I'm really glad to see this finally starting to come down the pipeline uh, and and make it into into the Linux desktop because. I think this is one of those stepping stones to making it possible so that people can be successful going from amateur to professional mm. without having to like bend over backwards and do arcane things. You know, much in the same way that I think, you know, 10 years ago people used to say the same thing about Mac OS 10 with the with the core audio framework. I mean, it's not quite that way anymore on 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 OS 10, you know, you can hear from the internet about how things have kind of regressed a bit. But the way that people revered the unified, high-quality, high-performance audio and video stack on, on Mac OS X back then is where I want to bring Linux to um, in the, as soon as possible, Absolutely. really, in the near future. Yeah, and you know, the thing is, Neil, there is, a, there is a market for this because Microsoft is more or less abandoning these users and focusing on Azure, which has nothing to do with, uh, you know, professional audio production or video production. And now Mac has really changed up the game, you know, going to ARM and, and with M1. And so essentially the message there to software vendors is you better, uh, you better get on board this platform and, and support these universal apps. And so this is a time where music studios or professionals or amateurs that are maybe semi-professionals are going to start to reevaluate the process. And they're going to reevaluate the computer and they're going to reevaluate the software that they're using and they're going to reevaluate what is the best way to get this job done. Pipewire is designed to be a multi-process. It's designed to separate the processing from the multimedia graph. And this makes it possible to integrate with other system components or swap out default policies for highly customized ones, uh, such as automotive or embedded. And by contrast, Pulse Audio uh, and Jack have very slow development cycles and they have very few new features and the more flexible and distributed nature of the design of Pipewire should encourage new uses and new features. Absolutely. And I think it, it's important to recognize that one of the, one of the, you know, the, the things that have kind of held us back in the multimedia space is uh, the sheer complexity in terms of getting um, a streamlined pipeline for you know high quality audio. Uh, for example, you know we're talking about you know radio as what you're doing now. Implementing this on Linux is a nightmare because you still you have to figure out all these knobs. You have to um, you know streamline the the actual uh, pipeline in which audio streams come in through the mixing layers and all that stuff. And depending on how wh which layer you want to work at or which layer your hardware supports because it's not always uniform or universal across the layers you you wind up in a bespoke is an, you know a bespoke configuration that's pretty fragile and this is something that really is not sustainable for for trying to you know push linux forward into the prosumer space which is where i feel is the next space that we need to go as we you know punch down from the high end down into the consumer space Absolutely. You know, one of the things I thought was very interesting um, with the way that this came about, and it's it, first of all, it's exciting to me that I can go actually read this proposal. I can read it from the person that proposed it. I can read the discussion occurring. I can read the rationale behind the code maintainers and, and why people are making the decisions that they're making. And this is a very different process than what we see with Apple or Microsoft. But one of the things that came to light and one of the things that I was excited to to, to notice was we saw this with Matrix and Gitter, and now we're seeing this with Pipewire, Ulsa, and Pulse. Uh, 
one of the things that they're very excited to do with Pipewire is they said, hey, when we're in when we're setting this up, we will make a Pipewire dash pulse package. And that's going to provide the same features as pulse audio. Um, it's just going to be a drop in replacement for the daemon that pulse the pulse audio client and the libraries will remain unchanged the front what the user sees they don't know behind the scenes because this is all open source we can get to all the code we can see how it works we understand how it works we understand how the path forward looks we understand where we want to get to where we are now and how and, and everybody can watch that process unfold that is so powerful and exciting and we're seeing this happen um I, so what let me ask you this neil Mm -hmm. What are some of the real world things that users are going to be able to see uh, if if this goes forward and all of a sudden Pulse, or Pulse Audio swapped out underneath the back and all of a sudden Pipewire is there? What are some of the things that people are going to be able to do right off the bat? Well, I mean, for one, it's going to enable um, a straightforward pipeline for being able to support containerized desktop applications for uh, for prosumer uh, use cases like using Ardour or or, um, or even uh, other kinds of streaming tools and PTV and OpenShot and 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 Caden Live and all these things that actually try to take advantage uh, or even OBS Studio. OBS Studio is, I think, the most famous one of these. When using all of these things uh, with Pipewire in this, uh, you know, at the central piece of the stack rather than adjunct or not really there it becomes so much easier for a wider range of software to be from a wider range of sources even to be able to uh, to operate as if they're just you know part of the system and and get the same kind of quality of service so i think it's more of a um Users are going to see something directly, per mm -hmm. se, because yeah, under the, hood. the idea is that everything will be transparent to them from that perspective. Mm -hmm. But what's going to happen is that you'll see applications that, you know, there's Fedora has been big on the whole flat pack thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the applications that are being served as flat packs, for example, in Fedora Silver Blue, um, with the upcoming Fedora Kinoite, maybe in, uh, for the KDE variant in the near future, um, these things will be able to offer the same kind of quality experience for uh, for audio and video stuff. Because we have GStreamer already for handling um, real-time audio sync pipeline stuff, and there's some work going on to make that accessible within um, Flatpak through portals and stuff. But Pipewire makes it so you have access to raw capture devices um, in a pretty... Um, Except in a pretty useful, uh, straightforward way with mediated device access, with privilege control, that sort of stuff. Stuff that you're probably used to if you're if you've ever worked from, for example, on an iPhone or an Android tablet or an iPad or whatever. Um, if you're trying to, you know, access hardware devices, and so that brings it to the Linux desktop as well. You know, I the, my understanding is that they're able to Pipewire is actually able to impersonate the API calls of uh, of Ulsa uh, and Jack, and so that's why uh, both the maintainers of those projects are are uh, are on board with Pipewire. Also, excuse me, not Jack, uh, Ulsa and uh, and Pulse Audio. Um, they've had. Um, They've had discussions with these developers and said, here's what we're looking at and here's what we're kind of wanting to do. And what do you guys think about that? And that, again, I think kind of circles back to this idea of you don't see developers working with other developers or companies working with other companies in that sort of open uh, ecosystem unless it's open source. So I, I agree. And in, in the short term, you're probably not going to see I any large changes, you know, in, in, from a UI perspective. But once you get those once you get that audio into software and and once you have support for the network stack, now you have the ability to take audio from any uh, in, from any server or any application and deposit it anywhere else. And the interconnects and interchanges that come into that and, and the matrices that you can build from that are fantastic and exciting and awesome. And I think it's going to fundamentally put Linux in a different category for professional video and audio than it is today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and like the big part about this is that historically speaking, um, professionals have had to, you know, finagle with very brittle things to make Pulse Audio and Jack work with each other in such a way so that some things can use Jack and everything else can have to use Pulse Audio, or they have to make Jack to pretend to be an also thing and then it redirect every. Thing, including Pulse Audio through Jack or the other way around where you have everything going through that. This all ends. You now have basically a streamlined, simplified pipeline 
from the hardware to the software, regardless of what you're doing. And also, remember what I said earlier about mediation. This is actually already being used if you're using GNOME or Plasma, KDE Plasma on Wayland because we already use Pipewire for resource mediation for screen sharing uh, for, uh, you know, if you're, if you're working in video conferencing and things like that, if your, if your video conferencing solution works in a browser or special case, if you're using zoom on GNOME or plasma and you have the specific override set, if you're not running Fedora, then it will actually just interface with Pipewire and it will grab the, the, the screencasting and do the right thing for you with Wayland. And this is the this gives you that secure channel where you can actually get these kinds of things working in a stable, sane API that you can rely on. And I think that's the most important part. This gives a, a, a consistent API with compatibility shims for all the older stuff that everyone can rely on on an an ongoing basis. What what kind of schedule might this look like if it decides to go forward? If if Pipewire is already used. Uh, for other purposes, for other reasons, and other parts of uh, of in other actually, I guess, how do you separate the how do you separate X from Wayland? But a separate version of Fedora, how much dif how much more difficult could it be to say to convince people to say, okay, this is clearly working over here. We probably should do this everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, I honestly, I'm not sure. Like uh, the biggest problem has been. Uh, you know, is the, the biggest thing I worry about is a repeat of what happened with Pulse Audio. When Pulse Audio was introduced a decade ago in Fedora, um, and it went kind of okay, it wasn't perfect. There were definitely glitches here and there. Um, and then it, that the demonstration of it actually working reasonably well, other distributions tried to copy it, but they did it poorly. Uh, for example, Ubuntu, oh, it was infamous for when they first introduced Pulse Audio that was so broken that it it took them like two or three cycles to actually uh, fix it. And it was mostly because they didn't really look at what we did in Fedora for that. What I'm hoping to avoid this go around, and, and one of the reasons where we're trying to be so specific about how everything is changing and why we're working with the upstream developers to make sure everyone is clear about what's going on, is that I'm hoping we can avoid that because that really poisoned the well for improving the audio stack for a decade. People were very, very reticent to try to do this again after after the whole mess that happened with that. And it wasn't even entirely like the upstream developers or the project integrations fault. It was, you know, some distributions uh, didn't do it right. And, you know, it wasn't on purpose or anything, but it led to a bad taste in everyone. And that's what I'm trying to, that's what I'm hoping to avoid this go around. Um, that being said, if this does actually go forward as, as intent, as planned, um, then what will just happen is, we will um, switch on the in the media to say um, if you uh, we will in start including Pipewire Pulse Audio and Pipewire LibJack um, on the media, and then just be done with it. And then you'll just start getting we'll start making snapshot releases and everything. And Fedora 34 will eventually come out with it, and just kind of keep going from there and build up on top of it, much in the same way that we did with the Butterfest change that we did with Fedora 33. Now. If it doesn't happen in 34, uh, like for some reason it turns out to be a little bit just not quite ready as we get as we get close to release time, mm -hmm. eh, we'll just punt it and then it'll happen in 35. Like the, it's not really like six months between one or the other is not terrible. I think I am reasonably confident, and the upstream developers are reasonably confident that we could do this in 34. But if it does, if if we want to, if we punt it to thirty five, I think that's not the end of the world. The goal will be to by the end of twenty twenty one, we will have this in place and and we can start really really start uh, making Linux a lot of a happier place for for pro professionals operating in Linux in the creative space. So this is specific, or this um, this proposal is specifically about Fedora, but you mentioned Linux in general, and I understand why you mentioned Linux in general, because the truth is sometimes there's just a better way to do things. And we kind of set the precedent for that with things like System D. What is your thought here? Is, is, is Pipewire such an obvious alternative to ULSA and Pulse that... Most distros are just going to look and go, yeah, that everybody else is going that direction. That's clearly the direction we go. It's just a matter of when, or is are there are there holdouts? Are are there going to be people that are going to say, wow, but 
this is where the benefit of Pulsar, this is where the benefit also is. It doesn't seem like we're seeing that. It seems like everybody's in agreement that that Pipewire is the replacement for these. So I, I think that comes down to like how the upstream communities uh, for um, for Jack, Alsa, and, and Pulse Audio is. Now, to be clear, Alsa, the Alsa user line and the Alsa stack itself can't go away. It's the literal interface between right the, the little kernel. volume slider and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's literally the interface between the kernel and your hardware and the user space. So that that's not going away. But everything that built on top of Alsa, so we're talking about um, Pulse Audio and Jack and all those other things. Those communities, those developers, um, are actively working with the Pipewire developers to build this as the replacement for it. So to some extent, it is fait accompli. It's going to happen. It is the way that that's going to move forward. Um, and as far as um, you know, other distributions, what they're thinking of, I don't think they're really going to have a, an option uh, to, to stay on a deprecated stack in the long term. Um, however, uh, I th what what is likely to see what I'm likely to see is that some of the more conservative or really really under under um, under resourced or under uh, performing distributions will choose to not try to do anything with this or attempt to block it, and then will eventually give up as more of the upstream software stacks transition away from legacy Jack and legacy Pulse Audio to Pipewire. And so I don't think they're going to be able to hold out for very long. Um, honestly, the reason why there isn't another thing or why people aren't seriously talking about holding out or, 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 or if something else is better is because the developers of those other things are all trying to help us move to Pipewire in the first place. Right. And the, yeah, it, it, and and this is exactly what I saw when I when I was reading through the not only just the original proposal, but other people's uh, explanation and app, you know uh, elaboration of the proposal. It, Neil, I want to ask a clarifying question. So my understanding is that the way that it works now is you have your legacy app. It talks to also also talks to Pulse. Pulse talks to also also talks to the kernel. And but you had a, earlier in our conversation, you had said that Pipewire gives more direct access. Um, to the hardware. So can you help me understand where the difference is between the way that Pulse, uh, or excuse me, the way that also talks to the kernel and the way that Pipewire talks to also talks to the kernel and how those two are different? So um, the main difference is really that for Pipewire resource access and such uh, has a more, um, it's not about changing the 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 actual um, the layering model that goes from from Pipewire down. So Pipewire still goes. Uh, so if an application talks to Alsa, it'll go to Alsa Pipewire, uh, and then Pipewire will call, talk to Alsa directly, and then go to the kernel and so on. Uh, this we have to do this because there is no software mixing support in the Linux kernel. The Alsa developers refuse to implement support for that. So we can't get away mm -hmm. from that from that from that requirement, but uh, but what this does is it makes it so we don't have to have stacked loops. So, for example, um, one of my friends has a pro, does dabbles in Pro Audio, and he has a Pro Audio setup as well. Mm -hmm. What he actually had to do was he had to yank Pulse Audio out of the uh, out of the communication layers to Alsa put Jack in there and then have Pulse Audio talk to Jack. And then Jack had to mediate between uh, Pulse Audio and Alsa. So you instead, you wound up having three layers and that led to latency spikes, dips, uh, all kinds of weird, you know, audio IO issues. Um, sometimes you'd have weird sampling problems because of impedance mismatches between, uh, you know, the bit rates that were being handled between Jack and Pulse Audio and Elsa. Like this is the problem we're trying to get rid of mm -hmm. by move by moving to Pipewire for all use cases, we eliminate the potential for creating these problems, and we simplify the way that uh, people can you know graduate through different use cases through the same audio stack, and and Pulse and Pipewire in particular uh, has a simplified mechanism for talking and mediating through audio than what Pulse Audio 
has historically done, which makes it easier to have lower latencies, you know, closer to real time kind of stuff without going as so far as to have real time kernel, weird patching to the to the daemon, and then having to do funky things with uh, um, with uh, um, you know markers and stuff with processes and like goodness knows stuff that I can't remember how to do because it's all very complicated. Neil Gampa, he is a Fedora contributor and a guest this hour on the Ask Noah show. Neil, you know you always have open invitation here, but you'll come back and join us around 34 or 35 and keep us up to date on where we are and if we make the cutout for 34 or 35. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to come whenever whenever you want me to. I appreciate it, Neil. Again, phone 855-450-NOAH. That's 855-450-6624. The email live at Ask Noah show. Dot com. So kernel 5.10 is the last stable kernel release of the year, uh, which per tradition is going to be an LTS release, as recently confirmed by kernel maintainer Greg KH. Now, there have been a number of bug fixes that are unusually high, uh, more so than it, than it normally is, just five weeks past the merge window, which surprised Linus Torvalds, but he said in pure numbers of commits, it's the largest RC5 we've had in the 5X series. He was quick to add that things are still under control and there's nothing there that makes him particularly nervous. But if all goes as planned, we can expect the Linux kernel 5.10 to be released around mid-December. Now, not a lot to take away from that. However, it, it what I would say is anytime you see a lot of things changing in a kernel and Linus Torvalds says, well, there's nothing that makes me nervous the way I choose to interpret that information is a lot of cool things are going to happen. A lot of things are going to get a little bit more stable and a little bit more polished and a little bit better. And uh, they don't expect any real problems. K-Stars 3.5 has been released. Now, I've been a Sterillium fan for a long time and uh, been recently as of the past year or so getting into, or at least I was before COVID, uh, was getting into astronomy. And um, one of the things I was interested in doing was connecting Sterilium to my telescope so that I could pick out a, a given star and, and go see it. Well, I had not heard of K-Stars, uh, but K-Stars 3.5 has been released with support for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And this particular release uh, is a significant milestone with the integration of Stellar Solver, the cross-platform uh, sex tractor and astronomy.net based internal astronomic solver. Um, and so if you've not played with any of the software before, or you're trying to find things out in space and want to explore uh, astronomy, these kinds of tools, especially the ones that are able to integrate um, with either other software platforms or with telescopes are, uh, are really fantastic. It features a FITS viewer, which has support for JPG, PNG, and RAW files for DSLR cameras, not uh, now, granted that not all of the features of FITS is going to be available, but this feature has long been requested, and now they finally backed it. They also have the Analyze module, which helps analyzing image sessions, details, records, and displays what happened during that image session. That is, it does not control any of your imaging, but rather reviews what occurred. And then there is a testing frameworks, and this release culminates three months of continued incremental improvements to K-STARS and the testing fr uh, frameworks spearheaded by Eric Jost. Uh, these tests cover both uh, uh, some user interface tests, but they're still far away from covering any sufficient tests for all K-Star uses. Um, so we'll have a link for you in the, sh in the show notes. Uh, check this out. I'm still learning about this as well and, and how to get all of this uh, the software up and running and, and what I can actually do with it. The, where I've gotten to is I figured out how to control telescopes and I figured out how to attach my camera to a telescope and how to interface uh, the software to that. Um, so excited to start playing with K-Stars this week and next week and, and uh, see how that fits into the mix. Uh, Comcast has decided on a 1.2 terabyte monthly data cap that's coming to 12 more states. This includes the District of Columbia starting in January 2020. 21. Now, the unpopular policy has already been enforced in most of Comcast's 39 state U.S. territory the past few years, but the upcoming expansion will be the first time to bring the cap to every market in Comcast's territory. Now, they're going to give you some courtesy months, which newly capped customers can exceed the 1.2 terabyte uh, warning without any penalty. And so the first overage charges for these customers will be assessed in April of 2021. But the cap is going to be coming to Connecticut, Delaware, Massachusetts, Maryland, Maine, New Hampshire, New Jersey, North Carolina, New York, 
Pennsylvania, Vermont, West Virginia, and, as said, the District of Columbia. The cap is also coming to parts of Virginia and Ohio where it wasn't already implemented. But again, all Comcast, nearly 28 million resident Internet subscribers are going to have this cap implemented. 2020 was the year that we all decided to work from home. We all had to move from home. And now Comcast decides at the end of 2020, today is the day, apparently, this is the year to restrict people's Internet access. Unbelievable. Comcast overcharges are going to be $10 for each additional block of 50 gigabytes up to a maximum of $100 per month. So customers can avoid overages by spending an extra $30 a month on a quote-unquote unlimited data or $25 for the XFi complete plan that includes an unlimited data and the rental cost for Comcast's XFi gateway modem and router. We had a client that had Comcast and they recently upgraded their modem and come to find out that Comcast's managed router has to be placed in line. Now, they're happy to pass that through if you want to put a customer-facing router on the other side of it, but if you take it out of the mix entirely, the internet goes away. Go figure what that's about. Here's the other thing that I took a, a real... I, I didn't like. Comcast says that the cap is for, and they use the word, super users. The Comcast spokesperson defended the data cap expansion by saying that a very small amount of customers use a disproportionately large volume of data. 5% of residential customers make up more than 20% of our network usage. About 95% of Comcast residential customers are less than 1.2 terabyte a month with a median customer average at 308 gigabytes, the spokesman said. But the cap is for those super users, the very subset of our customers and those super users users have an unlimited option. Okay, so first thing, really what you're saying is that you just want people to pay more money for their internet. But super users, really, seriously, take a typical house. I like local data, so this may not apply to me personally, but take a typical house. Let's say you have a mom and a dad and two kids. So you have four people in the house. Two of those people work remotely because hello, COVID. The other two people attend Zoom meetings all day because hello, COVID, and they have to be at school. So for six hours a day, they're on a 1080p video call, and 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 mom and dad are either on 1080p video calls or doing something else remotely, probably remoted into a workstation somewhere. And then we all get done at 5 o'clock at night, and we sit down and, and stream Hulu, Netflix, YouTube, uh, you know, Pandora, whatever else. And 1.2 terabytes? Who buys fast internet and then doesn't want to use it. Charge me more if you need to charge me more, but give me the service that I pay for and then get out of my hair. And then we get into the tracking and metrics. You know all those times that I said, us privacy folks, third-party data collection by ISP, this is bad? Well, here's what they did with all that data. Comcast customers would likely use more data if they didn't face caps. Now research by OpenVault, a vendor that sells data usage tracking information to ISPs, found that 9.4% of U.S. customers with unlimited data plans exceeded a 1 terabyte a month and that 1.2% exceeded the 2 terabyte in Q3 of 2020. For customers with data caps, 8.3% exceeded the 1 terabyte and 0.9% exceeded the 2 terabyte. So what we've known for a long time is that this has never been about technical limitations. It's not that their network is overloaded by the 20% of people that are using it, whatever, whatever the statistic was, less than 5% of people using 20% of their network. The reason is that they spent $12 billion to expand their network since 2017 to try to help with the increased capacity and network load that that is that is occurring from people even before COVID, were coming home, but now with the COVID pandemic has caused a massive increase in residential band, re, residential broadband usage. Comcast uh, has been spending money to try to fix this for nine months. So the idea that that all of a sudden they have to put this this cap in uh, because people are using too much too much bandwidth just it it doesn't add up. Uh, they're already spending money to provide more bandwidth to people. And so to me, it just seems like this is a way to get people to spend more money. But the point is, from a, from a tracking standpoint, they wouldn't have that information to try to decide, hey, here's what, pe here's what people are doing and here's how, what plans people have and how they use their data. That's none of their business. Just give me a pipe. Let Give me access to the network. Let, let me send my traffic. You send me the, the stuff that I return, and I will pay you a monthly fee to do that. It doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. I'll tell you uh, how to say this. 
Starlink is a, a, a service started by Elon, Elon Musk. If you haven't heard about it, they're launching, uh, their launch or have launched, I guess, since last November over the past year have launched hundred, uh, satellites up into the air and they're selling kits, 500 bucks and $90 per month. And you, you can go and request a, a beta invite at starlink.com and, um, Know a guy that that uh, that got one and got to play with it a little bit. They're they're pretty cool. Um, there's a lot of restrictions if you apply to the beta program, so be aware of that and be aware of what you can say and what you can't say um, if you have one. Um, but so far as I know, there's nothing wrong with talking about what other people's experiences have been. And it's you literally take it out of the box, you set it up, and in a couple of moments, it finds its home and you have internet and. We're pulling 120 down, I think. So absolutely fantastic. And this is going to give Comcast and all of their competitors a run for their money. And I couldn't be happier. Hey, thanks for joining us. If you want to join us live, we record this episode every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central. Of course, you can find the entire backlog at podcast.asknoahshow.com, as well as all of the articles that I use to prep the show or reference in the show. If you want to stay up to date with the latest, follow us on Twitter at Ask Noah Show. We'll see you next Tuesday, 6 p.m. Central, asknoahshow.com. Have a good week.